right, good afternoon. So previously we have been talking about memory. We have been talking about the basic processor design. And um, so today we are going to start a new series in which I just want to tell you like what you just, you, what you learned in the previous four weeks, they are just like the the basic of the basic and in 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 fact that a lot of stuff in modern processors or modern architectures they already changed so uh and it's really important that uh, when you learn something not only knowing the basic of basic but you have to know what's the state of the art so uh for this week we are going to talk about the state of the art and the first topic again because we have processor we have memory so let's start just talk about the processor pipeline again uh for the modern processors and you will find out like wow the five stage pipeline is no more in use and the modern processor pipeline is far away from the five stage pipeline and you might have a question like okay why am i spending so much time struggling with the five stage pipeline but you know uh it's like it's like uh it's like the basic math that you have to experience once so that you have the foundation to uh move forward so that's why we have that and but it's really important that for this week, you are going to learn what's a real processor, what a real processor that's currently in your computer looks like. So before we start, well, again, pipeline is the ba basic idea that we have in it before that, well, we have a clock control every unit and uh, every time after a clock cycle, it just advanced to one stage. So as you can see, uh, if you have pipeline for this pieces of a code, uh, there's no uh, there's no hazard if there's no hazard and on average you can get like an average uh, CPI equal to one. However, we uh, we also know that there are kind of tons of control ha uh, uh, hazards and one of the hazards that uh, we have been talking about is like control hazard. So you you need a uh, branch uh, branch prediction to help us address the control hazard so that we can keep moving forward keep fetching instructions. And there are, there are better predictors that can help us to improve uh, the accuracy of branch prediction. And um, today we are going to talk about uh, how to uh, achieve uh, what modern processor uh, that we have to, uh, 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 what, what, uh, how, how are we going to do those in modern processor. But before we start, like you also remember that well, not only control hazard, we still have like data hazards like this, right? So if you have data hazard, then uh, you have to stall for one cycle. That's what we previously learned. So uh, we have control hazard that needs branch prediction. And for data hazard, there's nothing else than, uh, well, for some cases we can use full data forwarding, but there are still cases that data forwarding cannot address. And uh, for, for, for the code that we have seen so far, uh, for the code that we demonstrated, uh, in the previous slide, we, we, previously we also have this question, there is no way the compiler optimization can help, right? So that's where we end, that, that's where we end about uh, the, the uh, data hazard. However, right now I wanted to think about that, right? Uh, previously, we just treat data hazard as data hazard, control hazard as control hazard, and we never thought about the combined effect of having uh, optimization on both of them. So right now I want, I'm encouraging you to think about this. So if I have a perfect branch predictor, like how many of the following, uh, which of the following pair can we reorder without affecting the correctness of the code?
All right, let's wrap up in 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay, so looks like uh, we probably need some discussion, but maybe a quick discussion. So why don't you uh, just open up the screenshot that I sent you guys and start discussing with your friend for another two minutes. All right, let's wrap up in 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay, so if you uh, discuss with your friend, you will figure out that, wow, after the discussion, like, uh, uh, the percentage of people who think about C is actually increasing a lot. And uh, the truth is that uh, the answer is indeed C. And uh, if you look at the, the uh, if, if you examine uh, the, the, the sequence carefully, you will figure out that, well, if we know the branch prediction is perfect, right? It doesn't matter if we, it, uh, the, and this is the dynamic instruction sequence. So we know this is going to be the instruction sequence that we will be executing. And uh, in this way, since we are going to execute both five and six, and there's no data dependency between five and six. And uh, for, for some of you may argue that for register number 10, but if you look at that carefully, both of them are the consumer of register number 10, right? So if if both of them are going to be executed and uh, the branch prediction is perfect, then you know it's safe to execute both five, uh, to, to reorder five and six, right? So, and that's something if the compiler cannot do because compiler can only see this part, like five to uh, one to five when they optimize the code, but not be able to, uh, but, but compiler cannot predict the future. So that's why, uh, that's why we come up with the idea. Can we if, we, if we think the branch prediction is accurate enough, and if there is a way that we, re, we can revert uh, the incorrectly, incorrectly predicted branch and its outcome, by any chance, can we reorder instructions across the branch to uh, avoid uh, 
to 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 minimize the uh, the pipeline stalls or say maximize performance, right? So here comes the idea of dynamic instruction scheduling and out of order execution. So let's go back to this slide. So this slide, as I mentioned, is very important because if you want to draw a pipeline diagram, that's what you need. So each instruction has to go through five pipeline stages. And, and in, the most important thing that I want you to remember here is that an instruction can enter the next pipeline stage only if all the following three, all the following three um, satisfies. So first of all, no other instruction is occupying the next stage. This instruction has completed its own work in the current stage. And the next stage has its own input ready. So in another way, you can probably consider, here's the criteria that you can put an instruction into execution, meaning that we can move uh, an instruction from instruction decode stage to its execution stage if the following criteria has satisfied. So regarding this instruction has completed its own work in a current stage. So if you consider the current stage as instruction decode, then it maps to whenever the instruction is decoded, right? And the other thing, no other instruction is occupying the next stage. It means whenever the target functional units is available. So for example, if I'm going to use LU, it means that if nobody else is occupying the LU, I should be able to use it. And the next stage has all its input ready, right? So all data dependency are resolved. So if you put this three sentence to the criteria of what you can, whether if you can execute an instruction or not, it maps to these three sentences and they are equivalent. So given this is the criteria, right? And as long as an instruction has its own data dependency resolved, then we should be able to put this instruction into execution, right? So it becomes really important for us to figure out what's the data dependency among instructions, which you already practiced in uh, the pre, uh, before midterm, but I want you to try to think about this in another way. So let's try to draw a data dependency graph around, among these instructions. So for this example, uh, for instruction one and two, they depend on the instruction, uh, uh, the register number six. So for instruction one, its output will be used by instruction two. So there should be an error among them. That's the dependency graph. So for data dependency graph, when you have, a, when you have data dependency from the source to the destination, you should put an error of that. Right now, let's look at, and as we mentioned, the data dependency should be defined as the output of an instruction is the input of the next instruction. So let's look at if there's any other people depending on the six of the instruction one, the answer is no. So let's look at for the second, right? So for sevens, well, we know three is depending on it, but other than that, we don't see anybody else is depending on the outcome of two. So uh, that's the only error we need to attach to two. Now, three, the store word instruction is not outputting any value. So nobody should be depending on it. But let's look at instruction four. It's outputting uh, to register number 10 and five is depending on it, six is depending on it, eight is depending on it, right? So for instruction four, we know, oh well, and actually nine is depending on it, right? It will have arrows to five, six, and uh, for six, it will depend on uh, it will generate the outcome for um, seven. So that's why you have a here. And for eight, it also, it also comes from the source of uh, uh, the, the output of seven. So there is another uh, dependency chain here and nine and 10, right? For 10, it, de for, 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 for 10, it depends on, uh, it depends on the, um, the, the output of nine, right? And also like uh, for four, theoretically you could uh, draw a, a graph. Uh, you should draw, for four, you should also draw an error here. However, uh, I skip it for uh, this graph because actually um, 
seven and six is also depending on four, so I just skip it, right? Um, but that's the that's the dependency trend. Uh, that's the dependency graph of this series of instructions, right? So if you draw the dependency graph like this, it's very clear that okay, there's no reason why we should be able. Uh, we cannot. Uh, we cannot uh, execute one and four in parallel because they are actually independent, right? So one, two, three, it's a, it, 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 it has all their, their own independent uh, dependencies. And this part of a tree, they have their own dependency, right? So in theory, these two separated part, they should be able to execute together. But here's what, what, what you gave me the answer, right? Only five and six, they can be executed in parallel or, or say like they can be reordered, right? But not one and four, not two and four, not three and four. Even though four is independent to any all of them, all right? So why? And the reason is because although although one, two, three, they are completely independent to uh, this part of the graph, but we are still constrained by false dependencies. And the reason why they are called false dependencies because they are not real data dependencies that should constrain your instruction execution. So that's why uh, prior to the midterm when the TA brought up the, the false dependencies, I tell you guys that, well, forget about them and even because at this point you don't need to know this. And the other thing is that, well, they are not data dependencies. They are false dependencies. They are false data dependency in a way that they should not, they should not be data dependency at all. Right. So uh, and and the false dependency, there are two types of false dependencies. Uh, the first one is called write after read. So it's a later instruction that would overwrite the source of an earlier one. So the, the, the reason why you have write after read is because we are limited by the number of registers that we have in a system. So it turns out that we have to reclaim uh, the usage of a register to put a new output value. So it turns out that uh, for a, uh, if, if you have a later instruction, that would overwrite the source of an earlier instruction, then you cannot reorder them because if you over you let the overwritten happening first, then uh, it turns out that, well, the, the, the execution result will be wrong. So that's why if you look at the right after right, like one and four, four and three, right? So one and four, four and three, they have the, Right, uh, right after read depend false dependency, right? So that's why you cannot. Uh, and this this red part just show you all the false dependencies that falls into to the category of right after read. And the reason is just because they will overwrite the earlier register because we are short on registers, right? So 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 turns out that you cannot reorder them. And for a similar reason, there's another type of uh, false dependency called right after right, uh, which is what I show in blue arrows here. Again, because we are short on output registers. So, and the other thing is that um, if you think about this is the compiler, right? Uh, this, is the, this is the compiled code. They are essentially the same instances of, uh, of, of the loop, but just, uh, just dynamically executed for twice, right? So they they just have to use the same register name, right? So again, a later instruction would overwrite the output of an earlier one because the compiled code asked them to do that. So that's right after right. An earlier instruction overwrites the output of a, a later instruction overwrites the output of an earlier one. So again, if you have this kind of, uh, Dependent, uh, false dependency, you cannot reorder them in your code because one of the output is going to be gone. So 
the false dependency is limiting our capability of uh, reordering. So right now, I want you to identify who are the false, uh, how, who are the false dependencies? Or who is not a false dependency? All right, let's wrap up in 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, time is up. Okay, so if you look at the, the voting result, then it's pretty evenly distributed among B, C, D. So it definitely shows that you guys need to discuss with each other. And uh, I already sent out the question through the chat. So just go ahead, discuss with your friend. Let's wrap up in 15 seconds.
five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay, so after discussion, looks like uh, C and D, they are popular. So can I have some of you uh, describing why do you think uh, is C or D through your group discussion? All right, so I have Albert. Hello. I Hello. think it, I think it's C. Okay. Um, I think C is the only true data dependency that is here. What's the definition of true dependency? The true data dependency means that the sort the output of a previous instruction is the source of a later instruction. That's exactly what you learned previously, right? Yes. So, so now I wanted, I, I'm curious about like, okay, what type of false dependency does one and four fall in there? Uh, one and four should be a write after write because they're both loading to the same place. They're both loading to the same register. So, so the, it's write after write, right? Yeah. So how about, um, how about, um, how about one and eight? One and eight should be a write after read because, uh -huh. um, um, because if Addy gets executed first, then the load word would be loaded, would be loading data into the, uh, loading the wrong data into the register. Right, so, and this is a true dependency, right? So how yeah. about four and eight? Uh, Four and eight, I think it's also uh, right after read. Yes, right after read, four and eight. Um, right, because for eight, it's overwriting four's input, right? So that's a right after read. How about seven and eight? S seven and eight should also be right after read, I think. Right, because the 20 here is actually the source of the store, right? Thank you. So I hope uh, it's clear enough for you guys to figure out like what's the definition of uh, uh, false dependency, right? So if you look at four and eight, which is the second popular answer, right? So four and eight, uh, eight is actually overwriting uh, four's input. So that would also be a false dependency. And if you reorder them, then uh, what, uh, the, the low word instruction is going to load from a different address and that would not give you the right result, right? So that's forced dependencies, right? And because, and, and another thing to think about is that if you draw the data dependency graph, you will figure out that only five and seven, they have an error on this graph, meaning that they are the only true data dependency here. All right, so I hope this would uh, clarify uh, who are true who are true, who are false. Okay, so um, now the question is that, can we design a processor that, uh, so if we really want to design a processor that would, uh, and uh, that, would, uh, that would help us to, uh, you know, uh, uh, just execute uh, the instruction sequence as, as the data dependency, then, Oh, how can we do that, right? So the truth is that, right? As, as I mentioned before, the, tr the false dependency, we are constrained because they share, comp compete for registers, right? So for this piece of a code, if I have the ability to rewrite the second part of the code which is, the, which, is the, which is the instruction after the loop to use a different set of the register, right? Because the lower instruction is going to start a new sequence of the loop. And these two loop iterations, they are not depending on each other. So theoretically, if I give it a different set of register here, then if we draw the data dependency graph, Right. So what you will see is that you are only going to have the true data dependency here. 
So previously, like one and four, um, one and four, okay, one and four. Okay, one and four is still problematic, right? But if you just look at the, 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 um, um, the sixth part, right? The, well, I don't think this example works very well, but if you look at the, like, uh, who else? Like six and one, right? If you can rewrite like six and one, right? Then uh, the, 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 the output register of six, then you will figure out like six and one, they do not have the right after right uh, uh, dependency anymore, right? And if I can do things differently, like this 10, I can modify it to be something like 11, right? And make this 11, then you are completely decoupling uh, the, 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 uh, the four and four and five, uh, four, four and five from uh, one, two, three. Right, because if you if you can make this four become eleven, well, let me put a different color here. So if I can make this uh, ten become eleven, right? Then uh, because four is outputting to eleven, so there's previously you have a data dependence, a false dependency between three and four, but right now because it's going to eleven, so all it only has it doesn't like have the right after read. Uh, data dependency anymore, right? So you will see that, and the same thing here, like I make the add immediate, like here, I made it like 22, right? So it's decoupled from eight. So there's no, there's no uh, false dependency anymore, right? So nine and eight, originally it has a false dependency, but in a new, new instruction sequence, there's no uh, false dependency anymore. So from this example, what it shows is that if we want to eliminate false dependencies, then the key is that we need the hardware to have the capability of dynamically rename the, the register, especially those output registers to something else, right? So how can we do that? How can we do that? So this technique is called register renaming. The basic idea of register renaming is that we decouple the architectural registers from the physical register. So again, you feel like every time when we have, an, we have a trouble, we have an issue, we just create another layer of abstraction. So when we talk about we have insufficient amount of memory, we create virtual memory. When we say that we don't want to know the detail about the processor, we create another abstraction called instruction set architecture. So here we further make the register now, even it's an abstraction. So the architectural registers are the register that exposed to your compiler, to your assembly language. However, internally, the processor itself has a set of physical register and a mapping table to map this, to dynamically map the architectural register to physical register. And whenever you have a new output, you just allocate a new physical register for the new output. And the following instructions that depending on that output will be alias or say redirect to the, the latest uh, physical register that map to that architectural register. So that's a register renaming. And in register renaming pipeline, uh, the pipeline is going to be a little bit different in a way that uh, we have a dispatch stage, which means that we are allocating a physical register for uh, the output of a decoded instruction. And we have an issue stage. It means that uh, the instruction is renamed of its, uh, its output register is renamed and it just put in a queue to wait for uh, the case to be able, uh, for, for the instruction to be able to be executed, means that we satisfy the three criteria that we mentioned. First of all, the target functional units is free. All the input registers, they are resolved and um, uh, it's decoded. So this is the issue stage when we are waiting for execution. And it's cute, depending on, which instruction that, uh, uh, which uh, functional units you want. We have, uh, uh, we can have like 
different pipelines for that, like uh, integer pipeline, branch pipeline, uh, memory pipeline, and send an instruction to the corresponding pipeline if there's no structural hazard. And finally, write back the result when um, when 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 your uh, data is ready. Okay, Harris, question. So is in this case, I noticed that there's no um, instruction decoding uh, stage in the pipeline. Or instruction they are, well, I mean, the is, well, these are additional stage of it. And you can assume that this pipeline is, uh, so this is the following stage after instruction fetch and decode. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, so Right now, let's look at that. So if we have register renaming, how are we going to uh, execute the processor? So, uh, so this is the overview of a processor supporting register renaming. So you still have to fetch decode instruction. And uh, again, that's the front end. And after you fetch and decode the instruction, you go to the renaming logic and the renaming logic is trying to allocate physical registers uh, to architectural registers. So you will have a register mapping table points to different locations in the physical register file. And uh, after you rename your instruction, you will have an instruction queue. And the instruction queue will store decoded and uh, instruction that has been renamed. And after you are done with that, uh, the instruction queue will see uh, if the physical register is available and if the branch resolve uh, is resolved. And uh, for this, according to the condition that's required for the instruction to execute, we will distribute those instructions to uh, the target functional units accordingly. And after uh, the instruction is done with execution, we just, uh, update its value into the physical register to trigger another round of instruction execution. So that's the basic idea of uh, register renaming in modern processing. So we can also use the pipeline uh, idea to draw what's happening after we decode an instruction. So let's say I fetch an instruction, I decode an instruction. Now, uh, the next stage of this institution would be let's rename this instruction. So for this low word instruction, uh, I can, uh, for now, my register, uh, register mapping table uh, would say like, okay, the current content in um, register number six is actually in physical register P1. So what I would do is that I, instead of uh, using load word six, 0, 10 as uh, the following of the execution, it will be renamed as low word P1, 10, 0. And that's renamed. And the next cycle, because right now, no one is using the memory pipeline. So this instruction will be put into issue stage. And for uh, the next instruction, again, because this is, uh, this this instruction is depending on uh, register number six and the register number six is P1 and, P and the seventh register is a new output. So we just allocate a new physical register for it. So that's why seven goes to P2 and because six is P1. So this instruction will be rewritten as P1, P2, 12. Now in the next cycle, uh, the lower instruction will go to its memory pipeline and the first stage of the memory pipeline would be address resolution, meaning that we are calculating the effective address. And for the store word instruction, which is the next instruction, we know we are going to rename it. So right now let's look at 10. We don't have a, we don't have a physical, or we, we just reuse the original 10 value, but for seven, we do have a physical register for it. So that's why you put P2 here in uh, the instruction. And in the next stage, uh, the low word instruction can go to low store Q. And for add instruction, because we are still waiting for the six to be generated because um, six is right now in P1. And if you look at the P1, um, it's still not having a valid value for a uh, later instruction to use. So you have to wait. So add has to wait. And, um, and for, for store word instruction, 
um, the the seven uh, the seventh value, which is in P two, is still also not valid, right? So the only thing we can keep doing is that let's re, uh, rename the add i instruction. And for the add i instruction, because it has a new output, so it's going to be in P three, and uh, which we allocate recently allocated, and then go to the next cycle, because ten is right now in P three. So the branch not equal instruction is right now depending on P3 instead of uh, on 10, right? So in this way, because branch is depending on P3. So originally there could be, uh, 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 there could be uh, some, uh, uh, some potential uh, issues with number 10, but because you, uh, you rename it, so it's resolved, right? And uh, for so so and if you keep going, you will figure out that at this point, right? At this point, you will you will find out. Well, for for the add instruction at this cycle, so it's a little bit interesting for this this cycle because uh, for this cycle, if you look at uh, the fourth instruction, register number ten is not depending on anyone's input. So this instruction can actually get into execution instead of waiting. So you can see here, we have a case of out of order execution because, uh, because force instruction is number 10 is not depending on anyone and um, other people who would override number 10, like, uh, sorry, uh, who would override number 10? Well, rename its number 10 output to something else like this one, right? The, the later out number 10 will be using P3 instead of the register number 10. So, uh, so it's decoupled now and there is no false dependency on that. And why not? Let's just go ahead and execute the fourth instruction first, right? Because one, two, three is no longer coupled with instruction number four anymore. So they have their own sequence of execution and number four, they can start a new series from here, right? So that's why, uh, so, so in this part you see it's out of order execution. And for fourth instruction in a following cycle, it can broadcast its result to whoever is depending on that. And obviously, obviously after you write back, after you write back instruction number 10, who depends on uh, the value of P3, uh, sorry, instruction number five, who depends on the value of P3 can now be executed. So in the next cycle, you can resolve the branch first. And uh, in the meantime, you will figure out, well, the, the fifth instruction finishes branch even before the store instruction start to work. And if you keep going, 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 you keep going you'll figure out that for the register renaming pipeline, you will actually take 12 cycles to issue all instructions and um, and um, if it's a well is if it's uh, and if you have sufficient amount of instructions and you can uh, regularly put this 10 instructions into uh, execution and you will figure out that you are going to have an average CPI of 1.2 for this sequence of instructions. So that's register rename. That's the that's that's register renaming, right? So. You, you might say, oh boy, I am completely freaking out. Is that the pipeline diagram that I have to draw in the final exam? Well, let me tell you a good news. No, because uh, for this kind of out of order execution, out of order execution, right? It's completely scheduling your instruction depending on the data dependency. So if you know how to draw the data dependency graph, you don't need to draw the pipeline diagram and you can still know how many cycle it takes for us to empty out the instruction queue. So here's the how. So here's the data flow graph that you, you know how to draw before. I just wanted to modify the data flow graph a little bit. So let's say if I give you a pipeline diagram and um, because for, for for the for the for the uh, for the uh, integer instruction, right? It takes two cycles 
because you need to wait for the write back to finish. It takes two cycles for dependent instruction to start, right? So you can assume any instruction that depends on the, the output of an integer uh, instruction, like an add instruction, it can only start executing two cycles after we uh, issue, uh, we put that uh, integer instruction into execution. So for example, like the four and five, the add instruction is an integer instruction and it takes two cycles to finish. So here we made an arrow two cycles long. And for memory instructions like this one, it takes four cycles. It takes four cycles to finish, right? So, um, and so we can assume like for this uh, load instruction, you just need to give the instruction depending on the load instruction for four cycle long. So like two, it's, let me put a different color, like two and one, right? Two and one, they are depending, uh, two, two is depending on the load result of one. And the one takes four cycle to output its value. Harris, yes. Um, so this is like the whole four cycles for memory. That's still assuming that all the data is located in the, in like the level one cache, right? Yes. I'm so if you have, uh, if you have a cache miss, uh, the actual latency will be longer. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Okay. So, so for, because this is like four cycle of parts, right? So one, two, three, four. So one and two, they should be four cycle apart, right? So if you draw this pipeline, uh, if you draw this data, data flow graph, you will figure out in a first cycle, we can issue instruction one. For the second and three, because um, the, the second and first three cycles, that's, that's what two and three they are uh, when they are decoded. However, two and three, because the second instruction, it needs to wait for one for four cycle, it can only be here. And for three, it has to wait for two. Uh, well, it actually also have to wait for one and two. Okay, it waited, well, sorry, for two, right? So uh, it's two cycle after two, right? So one, two, three, their dependency chains like this. And in a fourth cycle, we finally get the fourth instruction in. And if you check the dependency of four, it's not depending on anyone. So you can execute four immediately, right? And so if you keep going, drawing the graph, you will figure out it takes a total of 12 cycles to uh, complete uh, the issue stage for this series of instructions. All right. So this is the data flow graph and how many cycles it takes to issue all instructions. So let me give you an example here is that a lot of you like linked list. You think that's a very efficient data structure. And if you rewrite a linked list traversal code like this, uh, and let's assume uh, that, uh, let me see, uh, what's wrong with this question? Um, oh, okay, here we go. The, the link list has three nodes, right? So if I, if I want to traverse the link, I will have to uh, execute the loop uh, for three times. So if you have, this, uh, you have this three times three, nine instructions, how many cycles? Uh, do we need to empty out our instruction queue and put all instructions into execution?
Let's wrap up in 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay, so looks like we definitely need some discussion. So I already sent out a graph with my, oh, wait a moment. How come it's still standing? Okay, so I am right now sending uh, the screenshot with my drawing on it. So you know, the lower instruction would take four cycles to propagate the result and the integer instruction would take two cycles to propagate the result. And now, uh, please go ahead, discuss with your group and try to uh, you use the tool in Zoom to, to draw the data dependency graph together and see what's going on. All right, let's wrap up in 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay, so uh, looks like after discussion, uh, Okay, after discussion, well, still kind of like, you know, uh, like very, very chaotic 
you know, like uh, distribution. So uh, why don't why don't why don't we just you know uh, why don't we just like uh, uh, why don't why don't we just like you know have some of you like sharing your thoughts with us? Okay, Harris, what do you think? And Japong, what do you think? I will have both of you try to discuss, try to share it with us. Well, uh, I'm, our group was not able to find an answer that was below 30. Okay, Japong, how about you? Uh, we haven't made a consensus, but I think it's supposed to be 13. You, you think it's supposed to be 13. And how about Harry's? What does your group think? We keep getting around like 17 and 18. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, so, okay. So what if you do this? So, so Japan, tell me what to do. And uh, let's see, like, let, let's, let's, let's see, like, uh, and, uh, and let's have Harry's look, look beside you and see, like, what, if we are going to have a consensus with that, is that okay? Sure. Okay, so Japong, what's the first thing to do? Uh, rename uh, rename uh, instruction number one. Okay, so, so this is instruction number one, this is number two, this is number three, right? Yeah, and, like, and we likewise what we have uh, for- uh, We will have four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Yeah. Right? So how about instruction number one? Uh, you'll be issued uh, immediately. Uh-huh. Then the next cycle, we are going to have instruction seven, uh, two, right? Yeah. So for instruction two, can ye be issued immediately? Uh, yes. Okay, so two, right? How about three? Uh, three cannot. And how much time we have to wait? Uh, four cycles. Okay, so this is one, two, three, four, right? So one, two, three, four, right? So it will be, three will be here, right? Yeah. Okay, so how about the fourth instruction? So for the fourth instruction is again, load word can, uh, eight, ten, right? So for the fourth instruction, can so it will be fetched at you know one, two, three, four. It will be fetched at this time, right? This point, right? But can we execute the fourth instruction? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, so then we have to wait, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. and uh, so when are we able to? Uh, is killed the fourth instruction. Uh, four four cycles after three is like. Right, so it's supposed to be here, right? But right now the issue is because uh, this processor can all, uh, can, uh, well, yeah, we can do it here, right? So, and so we can put both instruction into execution, right? If they are not competing the same pipeline. Right. Wait, hold on. You can put both instructions, even though um, number three is still using uh, what is it? Register ten. Yeah, because you don't need the register anymore after the instruction goes to institution stage, right? After you read a value, it's done. Right. Ah, uh, yes. Right, right. because right. you're just so reading the value. It can be, okay. but four can only be executed at this time, right? How about the fifth instruction, job home? Uh, it can just do it right away. It can just be right away, right? So this is one, two, three, four, five, right? So five can be executed at this moment as well, right? But, but okay, so five. How about six? Uh, six, uh, I think six will have to wait after, uh, Three cycles after four. Four cycles after, after four. four. Four cycles after four, right? So here's the thing, right? If you draw the data dependency graph like this, right, you will figure out, oh, this is the this is the sequence of execution, right? And it will take 
uh, 10, 11, 12, 13 cycles to uh, execute or say put this instruction into execution, right? It's only nine instructions, but takes uh, 13 cycles to execute. So you know how bad the performance of linked list is, right? All right, thanks both of you. Harris, do you agree with uh, the data flow graph analysis that Japan has made? Yes, but I do have one comment about this uh, graph on the right hand side. Um, okay. So for instruction two, link, you know, um, leading to instruction five, right? That dependency over there. Uh, uh -huh. Instruction two is a integer instruction, right? Ah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing is that the fifth instruction only comes in at this time. Right. Ah, I see. Okay. They have dependency, but the dependency is already resolved. Right. All right. Is that clear? Yes. Okay, cool. So yeah. linked list, right? So thanks a lot. So linked list, you guys think about like it's a good data structure, but if you put the linked list into execution, right? And this is just like the linked list into execution, then you will figure out that it takes about like the 13 cycles to and to just and to issue uh, to just MPTL the whole pipeline, so it's pretty inefficient. Okay. Um, so if you are familiar with the processor articles, you probably heard about the term called superscalar. So previously we just say that we can only fetch one instruction at a time. So superscalar is the idea that since we have more functional units now, what if we can because we, we are actually having a pipeline of memory, we are having a pipeline of branch, we are having a pipeline of ALU. Why don't we just fetch more instruction at a time and decode more instruction at a time, issue more instruction at a time. So that's called superscalar. So the basic idea is that your, your processor would be able to fetch, decode, and issue more than one instruction for each cycle. So that's the basic idea of superscalar. And every modern processor, or say high-end processor right now, they are all superscalar processor. So this is the uh, original processor support register renaming, right? So uh, for superscalar, all you need to do, all you need to do is that for the fetch decode instruction part, you just make it, uh, you just make it like dual, uh, you can just make uh, the, 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 just you just make, dual fetch unit, dual uh, decoding unit, and just make the rename, rename logic twi uh, like twice large to resolve the, uh, uh, the mapping issue. So that's the whole idea of superscalar, right? So if you have a two issue uh, superscalar processor with register renaming, this is what it looks like. So in the first cycle, I can rename two instructions and again, uh, I just uh, I just put I, I I yeah I just rename two instructions at a time, and I just uh, put this two instruction in the queue. And the next cycle, I just fetch I just I just keep renaming two instructions like this. And uh, and if I keep going through the pipeline, you'll figure out that well there are more instruction. Uh, I just need fewer cycles to issue all instructions. Right, so that's the that's the whole idea of uh, register renaming. And if you look, uh, sorry, superscalar, and it takes only two. Previously, we take twelve cycles to issue all of them, but right now it only takes ten cycles to issue all of them. So that's the register. Uh, that's the superscalar register renaming. So um, now, the idea, my question would be like, let's go through the linked list again. Let's go through the linked list again and try to use. Uh, the data dependency graph, but right now you know every cycle you have two instructions coming in, and whenever uh, the data dependency is resolved, you can just issue the instruction um, uh, without uh, any trouble. So in that case, how many cycles now for the linked list uh, to be issued?
All right, let's wrap up. I mean, five seconds, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay, so looks like, uh, looks like, oh boy. I hate, I hate. Okay, so looks like right now, if you look at the uh, poll result, looks like C is the most popular answers, but is that really true? So why don't you go ahead and discuss with your friend for another, uh, for another uh, few minutes and let's see like if that changed your mind. So go ahead, do it.
Wrap up in 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay, so looks like after discussion, some of you think it's C, and uh, many of you think it's uh, uh, well. I mean, C is the most popular answer, but every answer has its own advocator. So right now, I do want to invite one of you, or maybe a few of you, to discuss to tell us what's going on in your group discussion. Okay, so Harris, right now, does your group finally know what to do? Yeah, well, we reached a consensus. We'll have yet to figure out if it's correct. Uh, e. Okay. Okay, so how to do it? All right, um, so. So this we'll... is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? Right. One and two can be executed on the same cycle. Okay, so one and two, right? And yes. that's the first cycle, right? First cycle. How about two? Uh, uh, well, you're, you're not going to get anything until cycle five. Right, you are not getting anything until cycle five. But at this moment, we know three and four, they are already in the queue, right? Yes. And mm -hmm. five is also in the queue, right? And right. For the fourth instruction, uh, for fourth cycle, seven and eight coming in, right? Yes. For the yes. five instruction, then, uh, well, we know nine and something else is coming in, right? So when when three come when three come in, right? We know three is depending on one, and it has it can only be executed here, mm -hmm. right? And uh, for four is depending on uh whose outcome it's depending on the first outcome right so it's also also yes. here right and for five it's also depending well it's not depending on anyone right no so it's five yeah. can be executed can be executed here right mm -hmm. and same as eight right eight right. can be here well yeah eight can be here because there are some dependency here so if you keep drawing this right keep expanding this graph how many cycles are we expecting? 13. Okay, uh, Nicole, question. Yeah, so just to clarify, between instructions two and five, they're both just add instructions. So there's only a one, sorry, two cycle delay. One, yeah, yeah, yeah. Want. Yeah. Okay, could you just clarify why? Well, because in this moment, you 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 use integer unit. Well, you issue you issue it right an integer right right back. And oh, you are okay, able okay, to thank you. Now. It's All almost right. like the data forwarding thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I actually do have a question to add as well. Um, how does branch prediction come into this? Because. I mean, so far we're just assuming that the prediction is spot on all the time. But... Okay, so you got it, and that's going to be in the next lecture. But at this point, right, the branch prediction does not change any uh, issue. It just branch is more like of a matter, like if the result is going to be trustworthy or not, right? Mm -hmm. And that's another thing that we will talk about in the next lecture. But if you keep drawing, surprisingly, you will find out. You will find out. And, and actually, you are bringing a very good point here is that, well, so if we draw the data flow graph, right, it will, it will figure out that, well, for this pieces of instruction, it still takes 13 cycles to execute. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Right, so this instruction is really, so linked list is really bad because it cannot allow you to utilize super scalar processor for this case, right? And, uh, and even though like we, we widen the, the, the issue with, right? So what Harris you mentioned is really good here is that, okay, first of all, right? What if six is mispredicted, right? What if, uh, what if, uh, and at that moment, right, you, you might already figure out that, well, instruction A is already finished, right? Instructions, so, so and if six is mispredicted, right? Suppose A shouldn't be executed at all, 
right? So how are you going to address that? That will be a topic that we are going to talk about next uh, uh, next uh, lecture. Nicole, do you still have question? Yes. Oh. Question? Oops. Sorry. Keep bouncing it. Hello. I'm good. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. No problem. Okay. So right now, um, so so we are going to talk about like how to address the misprediction issue in the next lecture. But before you leave the lecture, there are a few things that are really important for you guys to know. So first of all, we are going to have the Cape Survey uh, this week, and uh, I want to I encourage you to uh, give us some feedback. And another thing is that we know like it's really difficult for both of us, not only you but also us, on uh, using Zoom to. Uh, conduct a lecture. So we really want to know uh, what can we do or what's your experience of with Zoom. So we will have a survey uh, on that too. And uh, prior to that survey, we wanted to finish your case. And if you did both, you will get a full credit assignment. And another exciting news I want to share with you is that I decided to drop your lowest two assignments now, including the full credit assignment. Right. So, uh, well, although I don't, I, I'm, I'm not meeting you guys in person, but I can probably hear your woohoo in your mind. Right. So what does that mean is that, you know, you are dropping your lowest two, right? You are drop, we are dropping your lowest two, including that full credit assignment, if you did the cape. And uh, uh, one thing that I didn't say is that, you know, it implies that we are making assignment five optional in this way. Because I know this is the last week, right? This is the last week, right? So uh, it's a lot of time for you to figure out what to do. And I know like the last part is very hard. And so, well, every class is like this, two on the end of the quarter is getting harder and harder. So I know it takes a lot of time for you to digest the material for assignment five. So uh, assignment five is up already. Check the website. You, you, you can still turn in it if you want to turn in it. But uh, if you are already doing a good job previous, in a previous assignment, you probably don't need to turn in assignment five. All you need to do is to wait for uh, uh, like probably like uh, after Thursday midnight, the TA will pull up a solution for that. But other than that, I think that's, uh, that's, that's regarding CAPE survey and assignment five. And uh, if, you, if you feel like we put a lot of effort in this class, please give us good survey. Uh, a, a good CAPE result as well. Otherwise, uh, so that will be pretty encouraging for us. And finally, regarding the final, it's an open book, open note test. And as I mentioned, we are going to use lockdown browser, but you know, you probably don't know if the setting is good enough of, of, uh, uh, of, 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 of uh, is correct or not. So we, we have created a fake uh, reading quiz using that lockdown browser. So please try this out before Wednesday to make sure that lockdown browser does work on my environment. And if it doesn't work out, it will still give you sufficient amount of time to adjust your environment. So just make sure that you try that before the final exam. And the final exam, it will be September 4th, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Any consecutive three hour slot that you pick, it's open book, open notes, uh, but it's going to be longer than a midterm and uh, there's no Zoom and no one will be response on Piazza. And if you try to ask any question regarding the final, it would be considered as a cheating case because you are trying to initiate a discussion on that. Other than that, I think that's everything you need to know. Enjoy the rest of your day.